There's been some recent news about the air dish discrepancy conjecture, and a lot of people have been asking about what it means, so I wanted to talk about it. But first let's talk about why it's been on the news. It's because I can now call it Tau's theorem, because Terry Tau has proven it. So here's Paul Erdős and Terry Tau, both very famous mathematicians, and they both have lots and lots of accomplishments. So I couldn't just call this the Erdős conjecture. And as far as I know, we don't have Tau's theorem. So let's talk about what the basic object is. I'm going to take a list of plus one or minus one, and I'm going to think about them in some order. So as I go through plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, all this notation in terms of including the one and including the commas is a little redundant. So I'm going to break that, I'm going to just convert that into just plus or minus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Now one way to think about this and in general, it's kind of helpful is to think about a plus one as a heads and a minus one as a tails, as if I was flipping a coin, and it's going heads or tails. And the biggest thing is if I'm randomly flipping a coin, you would expect that the number of heads and the number of tails is actually pretty close. And I wouldn't ever deviate that from too much. However, uh, it turns out that, you know, sometimes we're going to have some issues in terms of balancing between heads and tails. And that's what the discrepancy conjecture is all about. And specifically the way I'm going to measure is, well, I'm going to look at this sequence of pluses and minuses, and I'm going to take jumps of a certain size. So I can start by taking jumps of size one, and I'm going to think about what is my sum along that jump. So if I go from here, I say plus one, minus one gives me a sum of zero, minus one, plus one. I see I'll go one, zero, negative one, zero. If I take steps of size two, then I'm going to be considering a different list of numbers. And I'll go negative one, plus one, plus one, negative one. So my sum is negative one, zero, positive one, zero. As I go through here and I'm summing my numbers, I would, if I expect it to be balanced, I would expect these values to be about zero or around zero. Now, because I've got discrete numbers, I'm definitely going to be varying at least one to the one side or the other. So saying I'm only zero is completely unreasonable. But if I can say I'm less than two, for instance, would be good. This gives me a measurement called the discrepancy, which is essentially the maximum amount of imbalance in one of these investigations. So you can ignore a lot of this notation. The important thing is that I'm going to specify some number of jumps n, and I'm going to specify some length of my jumps d. And then I'm going to say, well, take that n and d, and sum up the first n multiples of d, and think about how big is that value? How far away is it from zero? And that's my discrepancy. So in general, in general High discrepancy means I'm unbalanced, while low discrepancy means I'm balanced. So we would like to see low discrepancy if possible. And this is what the discrepancy conjecture was asking for, and now what tau has proven. If I have an infinite list, x sub i, of values taking plus or minus one, then the discrepancy is infinite. It means there's no finite bound. I will always be able to find some sequence like this that will, have a, will be very far away from zero. Let's talk a little bit about the context and some of the objects involved. So let's first talk about arithmetic progressions. Arithmetic progressions is going to be a sequence of numbers that I get by starting at some position and taking some jumps. So if I start at a position A and I take jumps of length D, that's my arithmetic progression starting at A and then A plus D, then A plus 2D, and so forth. Arithmetic progressions have been studied a lot, and here's one possible application. Maybe the most famous theorem about arithmetic progressions is called Van der Verden's theorem. And one version of it is saying, well, if I give an infinite list of values, xi, between, that are either plus 1 or minus 1, then there exist arithmetic regressions of arbitrary length where all of the elements are equal. This is a really, really cool theorem. This means that there's really, really long sequences that are these arithmetic regressions where I see the same value over and over again. Let's see an example. So the idea is I'm going to look at x sub a and then x sub a plus d, then x sub a plus 2d, and all the way down to x sub a plus kd, and along the way I'm going to always see the same value. Here's an explicit sequence of pluses and minuses. And if I look at x1, x4, and x7, I see that I see plus 1 in each one of these instances. So what I'm doing is I'm starting at position 1 and taking jumps of length 3. The issue here is that this isn't this sort of thing that's showing up in the discrepancy because I'm not starting at 0 and I'm not considering multiples of 3. I'm starting off a little bit. And so this fact that I can start wherever I want is a flexibility that arithmetic regressions have that we don't have in the discrepancy problem. So instead, we're going to look at homogeneous arithmetic regressions, which sometimes are called rooted arithmetic regressions. This means I start at 0, and I always take jumps of length d. And sometimes I'm essentially forgetting about the 0 and taking jumps of length d, so I'm only considering multiples of d. So if I take that same example and even make it a little bit longer, I can look at my, my jump sizes, and I can consider what all my discrepancies are going to be if I take certain lengths. So if I start with jumps of length 1, my discrepancies are 1, 0, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So I'm very balanced in terms of that direction. And also if I take jumps of 2 or 3. The important thing is that I'm always focusing on starting at 0 and then moving forward. That means that as my d increases, I actually have fewer numbers that I'm considering. And so uh, 
I don't have as many things that I'm, I'm caring about. And this, the, it's the interaction between these jumps that's really important to be thinking about. So a consequence of tau's theorem is that there exists these things called tau numbers, which I'm going to call Greek letter tau of k. And this is going to be the minimum n such that every list of just n values in negative 1 and plus 1 has discrepancy strictly larger than k. Right? I don't need to look at an infinite list. I can look at a finite list, and this will eventually happen for every finite discrepancy. I can only go to a certain length. We have knew a couple of these. Uh, the tau of 1 was known to be 11 for a long time. And tau of 2 was only recently discovered to be 1,161. And also tau of 3 is found to be at strictly larger than 130,000. We don't know if that's actually close to the right answer. And the important thing is these things are really, really hard to find. A consequence of the way tau proved his, his result, and I believe this is correct, is that tau of k is actually bounded above by an exponential function, 2 to the order k squared. By order k squared, I mean some number times k squared appears in the exponent above the 2. Another thing that tau proved is actually that you can use, instead of plus and minus 1, you can use unit length vectors from pretty much any space you can think of. So one interesting multidimensional version of tau numbers is tau sub d of k, which is the minimum n such that every list of n unit vectors in z to the d has discrepancy strictly bigger than k. This is a much harder problem, but now we know it's finite, so we can investigate these numbers and think about it and see what so, sort of upper and lower bounds we can get. Thank you for watching.